pour maintenant. Ok. Si vous voulez, on peut commencer. Hein, vous... Yeah, we, we may start. Ok. Yeah, let's start. Uh, so we're glad to welcome Redouane this morning for a, for a talk on ongoing activities. Uh, sorry, Dan, I let you uh, the floor okay. for, for this talk. Okay, thanks a lot, Ronan. Thanks to uh, the Oceanics uh, team for, for inviting me. This is a really good opportunity to reconnect again with the LabSIC. For people who, who don't know, actually, I did my PhD uh, with Ronan in the LabSIC team. So I'm very glad to be with you today. So uh, yeah, my name is Ron Radouane Gensert. I'm a postdoc right now at the uh, L'Océan Laboratory in Paris with Sorbonne University. And I'm actually affiliated also to LSCE with the uh, Sarah Saclay. And today I would like to talk to you about a uh, technique which is starting to, to have a, a bit of popularity in the climate modeling community. And this technique is really interesting for you guys who are, who are doing, uh, for you people who are doing uh, signal processing, machine learning, applied to uh, climate modeling or to geoscience in general. So this technique is called history matching. So uh, this presentation will be a lot about the method and not much about the results because it's still an ongoing work and you see, you see what, I, what I mean. So uh, whenever I do a presentation uh, about this techniques in general, especially for when, when it's destined to climate models, I like to, to talk a bit about AI applied to geoscience in general. And I, I I prefer to start with this example, with the example of Edward Lawrence, because I, I really like this scientist and I see him as one of the first to do machine learning for, uh, for geoscience in general, but for weather forecasting in particular. So you probably know the butterfly effect, so Edward Lawrence is probably known by that, but he's more known in the, uh, in the data, science, uh, data science and uh, climate modeling, I mean interdisciplinary um, domain by being one of the first uh, researchers to use machine learning for weather time series forecasting. And you'll probably know two of his uh, famous papers. One uh, on UFs uh, was published in the 50s and the other one on the analogs, which was published in the, in the 60s. So uh, since much of you are from the signal processing community, you will know that UFs are just actually another name for principal component analysis and analogs are just another name for nearest neighbors. So I'm always asking this question, was Lawrence not in contact with the ML community at that time? So um, every time I do a presentation, I put this slide, this question, I'm still waiting for an answer. But, uh, but what's really important is that the situation currently is completely different, really completely different because now the connections and yeah, yeah, the connections actually between the two communities are now uh, are now big, big, and there are a lot of exciting things happening in this interdisciplinary uh, field. So uh, these are just some examples I'm showing here of uh, like uh, workshops or conferences that are now interested in this uh, in this interface between AI and earth science in general. Uh, there are a lot of special sessions uh, recently in EGO also and AGO, you, you know already about these uh, big, big conferences. And uh, yeah, next month, yeah, in April, in April, we will have another, another time, the session Machine Learning for Earth Science, which I'm co-convening also this year for the second time. And uh, we, got, uh, we got the double of abstracts than last year. Last year it was like 30 abstracts, but now we have like 60 abstracts. And this is just one indication that the field is going really in an increasing, uh, an increasing way. So now let's uh, go to, uh, to really the, the center of, uh, of my presentation uh, about this method, which is, which is called history matching and that I will, uh, I will detail uh, in, this, uh, present, in this talk. Um, I'll probably miss, uh, I'll probably just skip this slide, it's just about my background, so yeah, just to say that I'm coming from the machine learning and signal processing community, I went uh, in my postdoc to spend uh, some time in physical oceanography labs to like gain more, more, uh, yeah, more knowledge about the physics and combine that with my knowledge about uh, data science techniques. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I should mention this. I'm, I'm actually funded by uh, the Make Our Planet Great Again uh, Fund uh, with the project Hermes, which is High Resolution Modeling of System Earth, uh, fund, uh, lead by uh, PI Venkatraman Balaji. 
So okay. now I'll explain to you what does model tuning mean in simple terms. So um, yeah, just imagine uh, a climate model simulation code. It's just a code written in Fortran in Python as you wish. It's a very big code, a lot of lines of codes actually, and it takes a lot of time to, to run it. Sometimes it takes hours, sometimes months to run the codes. And you have some parameters uh, that you calibrate or you tune uh, before starting your code. Uh, and then you run, you let your climate model simulation code runs in time, and then you get your output and calculate some kind of metrics. For example, in oceanography, you can like uh, calculate some metrics related to the AMOC, to the Gulf Stream, to the Mediolan head, heat transport, et cetera, et cetera. And climate models compare these metrics with observations they have about the system, about the earth system in general, okay? So tuning is simply this, this process of estimating these uncertain input parameters in order to reduce the error between what you get with your metrics and the observations. And, and here I'll show you an interesting paper if you, if you want to delve deep into details of model tuning. This is a paper what, uh, that, was, yeah, that was published in BANTS by Frédéric Ourdain et al. And here is a sentence I found really interesting when I started reading this paper. So uh, the authors here were, um, were like crit criticizing why there is no much transparency when reporting uh, the result of tuning parameters. So you know, for example, in CIMIC 6 models, there are a lot of papers explaining each of the models used for, uh, for climate uh, I mean predictions, but they don't often explain how they did, how the researcher did to tune the parameters of their model. So it was, uh, the, the author said, why such a lack of transparency? This may be because tuning is often seen as an unavoidable but dirty part of climate modeling, a lot of engineering and science, etc. So uh, this made me uh, think of, for example, when you try to, um, to train neural nets, if you, if you train uh, trained neural net yourselves, you know that there are, there are a lot of hyperparameters to tune, for example, the number of layers, numbers of neuron activation, et cetera, et cetera. And I was also personally taking this as a dirty part of training, of training neural nets when I just yeah, I use the 64 neurons or 128, why exactly this, this uh, number, et cetera. But now, uh, yeah, recently there are a lot of um, techniques to do hyperparameter search. So this is, this is really a one way to see this problem from, uh, from the eye of someone who did a lot of uh, tuning, I mean, in, uh, in machine learning. So yeah, th this is just a sentence to say, yeah, that it is important that modeling groups communicate also their tuning strategy, not just their results. So for tuning, you have two, two big techniques to do tuning. Either, yeah, that, that are better than naive trial and error because yeah, I, I discussed with a lot of oceanographers, for example, and they just do this. They just take some numbers for the input, run the simulation, see the result, and then see if it's, if it's good or not, and then go back again, change a little bit the, the, the parameters, run again the simulation, et cetera, which is quite time consuming and not, not efficient. So you have two families of techniques to do that. First, you can optimize a cost function, measuring directly the distance of your model simulation to observation. And for that, either you have a model which is uh, different, fully differentiable so that you can use your gradient-based techniques. Uh, yeah, th there are a lot, I'm not going into, into details, or you can use your favorite gradient-free based technique, genetic algorithms, uh, Ensemble Kalman inversion, et cetera, et cetera. If your model is big and you don't have the adjoint or you cannot do back propagation on your model. Secondly, you have another family which is, uh, which is more, more, more related to the uncertainty quantification techniques, which are Bayesian approach that provide uncertainty for the parameters using some statistical models uh, that relate the climate, climate model and observations. And I'm here interested in one technique from UQ, which is called history matching. So now I'll explain to you what's, what's the idea and the, uh, the philosophy, let's say, behind history matching. So this is just the, the same thing I've shown you before. So you can either do, as I said, an optimization problem. So just find 
the, uh, the set of parameters that minimize a loss function between the, your metrics, so your, your output, and the observation. But there is one problem with that, especially when you work in, in climate modeling, is that actually tuning this, this uh, handful of metrics uh, can risk you to do what, we, what they call actually overtuning which is that your solution will be very related to some uh, set of metrics uh, at the expense of and physical behavior maybe if you missed some other metrics or process that that were not used uh, in tuning so in the paper of Urda et al that i showed you before they they, they actually mentioned this opportunity as a real concern and the raison d'etre for bayesian new methods you can also see it as a kind of overfitting. I'm not sure if I can say really overfitting here, but you can see it maybe as a as a type of over of uh, overfitting. So the idea behind history matching, uh, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll skip this and I'll go back to it. Yeah, here. That instead of looking for the best set of parameters that solves your optimization problem, you will take a model strategy which is trying to rule out the bad parameters, the bad set of parameters. So you have your space of uh, search, of parameter search, and you will try to reduce it to like uh, just to rule out the bad parameters instead of finding the best uh, local, global or local uh, minimum. So th this is really the uh, strategy behind, B because actually as if you work uh, a lot in climate modeling, you, you know that having just one set of parameters is not the right thing to do. You need uh, to have like an ensemble of simulations uh, to, uh, to really, uh, to, to, so that you can uh, estimate your uncertainty. Yeah, and history matching is closely related to another technique uh, called approximate Bayesian computation, ABC, which is, which is quite classical also in computer simulation. There's another domain co uh, called computer simulations and surrogate models to get models maybe that uh, that can be known for for people working in machine learning and the idea is history matching has been there for a long time it was i think um, uh, the first works were in the 90s if i'm not mistaken but it just started to uh, to be applied in climate science so it's really a very interesting technique which were established for a long time so maybe this is the time to uh, to take it from the shelf and uh, adapt it to climate science. And yeah, and one thing, uh, one thing that really attracted me to history matching is that it has a component that uses machine learning and I'll talk about this in the next slide. So uh, if you are in this problem of trying to tune in parameters, let's say that you have ideally, uh, I mean, unlimited uh, computing, uh, computational power what you can do naively is just try all the combination, the possible combinations of your input parameters and just run your models and uh, take the best models that are close to observation. But unfortunately, you cannot do that because yeah, it's impossible. The climate models are very expensive to run, takes a lot of time. So uh, that's why first we need what we call space filling designs. So instead of trying all the um, all the combination of, of parameters you will just select some of them but some of them in a way that uh, that like uh, fill your uh, your input space your input parameter space you need to cover it as much as you can and secondly you need to replace the expensive simulator with a rapid and cheap emulator or surrogate model so uh, if you have, let, let's suppose, and this is actually what, 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 what happens in my work, you can suppose that uh, oceanographers or climate models or people working in atmosphere have already some uh, simulations that run a long time ago and they already stocked, uh, stored them somewhere. So you have your, their set of parameters of input and the metrics they calculated. And uh, you won't probably have millions of these simulations. You will just have a handful of, of them, like uh, 40, 50, or just a small number of them. So what you can do is do supervised learning because you already have like inputs. So the, the selection of parameters in the input and your metrics. So these are the input of your machine learning, let's say, or supervised learning technique, and the output is are the metrics. 
So you can already do some kind of supervised learning and try to yeah to to estimate to estimate the metrics using new sets of parameters. But what we also need is also the uncertainty about these estimated metrics we use. In general, in climate modeling, we are not interested only in the in the mean of your distribution, but we need also to have information about the uncertainty of your of your techniques. So that's why uh, this is the the I mean the uh, general pipeline of machine of uh, history matching. So first, what do you do is that you have an initial guess of your parameter space. For example, you know that parameter A uh, is actually uh, located in um, in an interval between minus ten and ten. For example, parameter B minus thirty and thirty, and you construct your initial parameter space. Secondly, what you do is that you select some some points initially to start your space filling design. And the idea is you will start a small number, you will select a small number of, of, of sets of parameters, but at the same time, try to cover the space, the initial space as much as you can. And for that, there is a, um, an independent um, research field for doing this called space filling designs. And one technique which is quite, quite popular is using latent hypercube sampling. If you want to have a visualization of what, uh, of what this technique is, if you think about like a 2D dimensional space, and uh, for example, you can like imagine a, a checkerboard, a chess checkerboard, and the idea is putting rooks, so the rooks moves, uh, move um, horizontally and vertically, and you need to put like rooks in a way that each one doesn't threaten the other. So in this, you can have like eight rooks that, uh, that cover the space. And uh, this is one way to like visualize this idea of, uh, of LHS. But uh, yeah, but obviously we are not working in two dimensions, but we are working in, in higher dimensions. So there are techniques to do that. So I'm not going into details here. So when you have your number of, uh, of first, let's say sets of parameters, so just a handful of them, you run your uh, simulator, your big simulator that takes a lot of time, you calculate your metrics, and then you construct uh, a database, a database of inputs and outputs. And then you go to the machine learning part where, where you train an emulator that will take the inputs and try to, um, to be close to your real outputs. So it's just a classic supervised learning. Uh, I'm sure you already know about it. But as you remember in the last slide, I was talk talking about like estimating the, the mean and also the uncertainty. So that's why in the literature, there's a lot of papers and it's the majority of papers, I think, that use a technique called Gaussian process regression. So Gaussian process regression is just a supervised learning technique, very classic and very easy to use. It has a long history, well established, but, but if you compare it to like deep neural nets, there are some connections. For example, there is, a, I think, a very um, old work that say that one, uh, no, a neural net with one uh, layer, but with infinite number of neurons can be actually, can approximate a Gaussian process, a Gaussian process, which is a very strong, uh, very strong result. But the thing is, it seems, and I'm not very expert on that, it seems that Gaussian processes are not very, I mean, practical for higher dimensions. That's why you, that's why you see that deep neural nets are now ubiquitous everywhere and uh, they have a lot of success, but Gaussian processes are still have, uh, have not reached the same success. Uh, another point, maybe just for uh, general uh, knowledge, if you know about cuisine or optimal interpolation, and I'm sure you, uh, you know about it, a lot of you know about this, uh, it's actually just Gaussian process regression again. So it's just another uh, special case of uh, Gaussian process regression, okay? So yeah, the idea is we will get some estimate of the, uh, of the mean uh, of your uh, output and also get an estimate of the uh, uncertainty. So when you get that, you calculate what we call an implausibility. So it's just like a way to say that your set of uh, inputs is actually a good set of parameters or not. So for that, Z is your observation and the expectation of F theta is just actually the result of your uh, emulator 
and the variance of f theta is the uncertainty of your emulator. So yeah, your Gaussian process gives you an estimate of the mean and an estimate of the variance. And you just do that, you just do a very simple, it's a simple expression actually, which comes from the Pockelsheim uh, sig uh, sigma rule. The idea is that, you know, uh, for unimodal distributions, 95% uh, of the probability density is within three, for example, three standard deviations of the mean. So that's why you use uh, the number three. So if, if your quantity i, which is the implausibility is higher than three, that means that your set of parameters is not good. So you just rule, the, rule, rule it out. If it's um, lower than three, you keep it. And you keep it in a set, which we call, you will see later, it's called not, not ruled out yet, or the NOI. Uh, so I will mention a lot of uh, times this NOI term. So it's, um, it, it stands for not ruled out yet. So the, the main goal of history matching is this. It's taking a big initial uh, parameter space and then calculate the NOI space, which is lower and smaller than the big uh, space in the beginning. And another thing that I should mention here is that history matching can be done in waves. I mean, when you finish and you have your NOI, so the, the reduced space where you can do again history matching and do it in waves. So it's an iterative process if you, if you would like. Uh, just here, I'll go maybe quickly here because I've spent a lot of time on, on, on the method. So here are just some works uh, which, are, which are actually very recent. So papers from 2020 and 2017 uh, that applied, applied uh, history matching in the context of climate modeling. So what you will see in the literature that there are a lot, of, a lot of works on the atmosphere component, but not much on the ocean uh, component. And maybe one reason why is that actually in the atmosphere, there are a lot of short time scales. So for the, uh, their simulator, they won't take a lot of time to like generate a lot of data to use for their, for their um, emulators or surrogate model, which is not the case for ocean models. For ocean models, if you need to like calculate metrics, you need, uh, you need to, to run your ocean models for a long time to stabilize the ocean component. And this is maybe one of the reasons. I, I think personally that uh, history matching could be used could be used actually in the oceanic in the oceanic uh, community when we will have like more computational power and uh, and can like generate a lot of simulation. So so uh, the the second work I'm showing here, the one of Williamson, is a really great work, and it was in 2017. But they worked on a Nemo Orca two uh, degree uh, grid. Uh, and the reason why is that actually uh, the computational power was not sufficient. Uh, I, I remember him, uh, they mentioned it in, in the paper. So going to Nemo Orca one degree uh, could be one of the things that, um, um, that, uh, that could be done. And I'm actually interested of doing this in the future. So that's just uh, a slide to say that history matching is starting to get, to get really um, not popular, but uh, to, to attract to attract attention in the uh, climate modeling community. But there is one catch. Uh, there aren't a lot of pa papers, or I'm, I'm not, uh, in my knowledge, there, there is no paper trying history matching on coupled model. I mean, like ocean atmosphere or ocean by geochemical um, components. So uh, this is maybe because we're still in the beginning of the windows. But uh, but I say, I can show you here one, one um, well, recent result from a project called Quest, and uh, they did a, a very interesting experience. So they took they took actually a um, component, an atmospheric component called LMDZ. It's uh, it's developed in IPSL. They did history matching on that. So it was the the team of Frédéric Urda, uh, and they did history matching on that. So they had a tuned uh, atmospheric component. For the oceanic component, they did the, like classic, uh, classic tuning, test and error, some uh, simple techniques. So they had another uh, component, the oceanic component, which was tuned independently. And then they coupled both components and ran the simulation. So what they found is that it doesn't work as they, uh, they, they were expecting. So they still got a lot of biases in temperature at two meters, in sea ice cover in the northern atmospheres. So they did again another uh, round of tuning of this big, uh, I mean, a coupled model. 
So th this is actually, so applying, yeah, applying history matching directly on couple of models is still underexplored and that's one of the things I'm very interested in. Um, yeah, I'm already, I don't know how much time actually I, I have left. Yeah, I mean, we are not, we are quite flexible on this. So, okay. Okay, so okay. usually it's more like 30 minutes for the two, but I mean, all right, all right, I'll, I'll we try are basically right. up to noon. Okay. So. so, yeah, so instead of uh, trying history matching directly on, on big and coupled models, so this is just actually a figure that shows the time, the CPU time, if you want to run uh, coupled models, I'm not going a lot into details, but the message is. I won't just like uh, start an adventure and and run in a couple of models uh, and do history matching on that if I don't have like a control um, a control and an, a toy model easily a toy model where I can like try other techniques of history matching play a little bit with the method so that's why I'm I'm now I moved to Lawrence ninety six model which is a classic. Uh, model that uh, that is known by a lot of uh, people uh, which are present here. So now I'll show you uh, some first results. It's not uh, it's still an ongoing work, as I said, on the Lawrence ninety six uh, model. And as I told you, actually Lawrence ninety six model is interesting because you can because there are two two components. Uh, you have the X component and the Y component. The X component has slow dynamics and the Y component is uh, fine scale uh, and has uh, fine, fast dynamics. And you can like find analogies between the Lorentz 96 and the uh, ocean atmosphere because the ocean is a slow component and, and the atmosphere is a fast component. So that's, that's actually the reason why I choose uh, to play with the Lorentz 96 uh, model. So for people who are not very familiar with so the idea is you have a set of ODEs and the X, the X actually is, um, yeah, you have um, a number of X variables which are circular as you saw in the animation here. I'll uh, start it again. And, uh, and actually, yeah, it's a, a circular matter uh, in a circular, uh, circular shape. And each X is related to, uh, to the two neighboring Xs, okay? And also each X is related to a number of Y, uh, of y variables. For example, here 10 variables. I mean, each X K is related to uh, 10 uh, Y uh, K, okay? And you have this set of parameters uh, of uh, equations, sorry. So the idea here is to try history matching to tune the parameters, the four parameters that are classic here, which are F, H, C, and B. <clears throat> So uh, yeah, so before doing history matching, as you remember, you need to uh, specify your metrics. For the metrics, one thing which is really interested here, because I know in your group, you are doing a lot of uh, work on uh, Lawrence 96, but to uh, like reconstruct all the state, to start the dynamics of the state. But what, what we want here is not to do, is not do that exactly, but uh, work on like climatological quantities. So I'm not like, trying to reconstruct exactly the state, but I'm trying to match statistics, just statistics on the, on the, on the model. Uh, concretely, I will run the Lorenz 96 for a long time, for example, 100 days, if we denote one day as the time unit of, of Lorenz 96, and then take like temporary means, temporary means. For, so this is what you see in the F, FXY, so X is just a temporal mean on, on the X's. So if you're here, I'm taking 36 variables X. So you have like 36 uh, means and uh, you have your Y bar, which are the, uh, like a spatial temporal mean here in this case. So you have again 36 Y bar and you have X squared, which is uh, more related to energy, X Y bar more related to coupling, et cetera. So these metrics, I took them actually from a paper, a very interesting paper actually by Schneider et al called Earth System Modeling 2.0. And they are justified by energy conservation constraint. So again, the idea here is to have some parameters in, the, um, in, the, in your input for your model, which are FHCB, and you run your simulation and then you calculate your statistics. These statistics, uh, which are shown by FXY, okay? 
the ground truth here, uh, I mean the observations also, I took them as, as the ground truth, which are the, uh, what you see here, F equal 10, H1, C10, and B10. And the, the observation here is uh, really perfect, no noise. So the ground truth is, is actually the observation at the same time. For the history matching code, there aren't much codes which are available and easy to use. And I spent a lot of time uh, looking at them. Uh, there is one which is quite advanced, but it's coded in R. So I'm not very familiar with R. So I just told myself, maybe I'll do a Python code and just uh, start from scratch. So I, yeah, so I just developed a code from scratch using Python. And another reason is not just because R, I'm not familiar with R. It's because actually there are two uh, very interesting libraries that um, I found very, very nice, uh, which are gpflow and gpytorch. So gpflow, uh, gpflow is for doing Gaussian process regression on TensorFlow. And gpytorch is for doing the same on PyTorch. And they are really good, very, I mean, uh, there is a lot of, uh, a big community behind. And uh, you can do that, you can train it on GPUs also, which is very, very interesting in my case. So yeah, so the code will be will be shared when I uh, when I finish with this work. So I'm uh, I'm in the process of uh, commenting it. Uh, and yeah, and stuff. Uh, yeah, here in the end, I'm showing the initial guess. If you remember, for the history matching technique, you need an initial guess of parameter space. So for this, you need uh, actually to talk with the physicists from the domain, so they can like tell you, for example, that the C parameters need to be positive and the uh, C parameters cannot like have a value bigger than 20, for example. So you just like have a prior, it's a, you can see this as a prior and have your intervals for each parameter. Uh, yeah, so I'm showing here the steps, the steps of the history matching. So the, uh, I've talked uh, about this uh, before. You have your initial guess of parameters. You do your sample, you, you, you you do your uh, latent hypercube sampling to get like 40 samples. So you can ask the question, why 40? Actually, this is an empirical result uh, that was done in, in the computer simulation experiment community where they say that you need only uh, 10 multiplied by the number of parameters to start your uh, history matching um, pipeline. For example, here we have four parameters to calibrate between. So we will just generate like 40 samples, okay, from your, uh, from the LH, uh, S, uh, S. So you have your space filling design, you run your uh, Lawrence 96 model, and you have your, and you construct your training database, right? So you have your X train, which has four dimensions, and you have 40 samples, and you have your Y train, which has also 40 samples, but 180 dimensions, because you remember the metrics there were like five turns, but each turn is actually a 30, 36 um, dimensional uh, vector. So one thing which is really interesting maybe for you, for you, uh, if, you if you want to, to discuss it is that when I read, when I read the, the literature, I found that um, researchers in the, in the field, they don't try to, um, to model directly from the 40 dimensional here uh, input to the 180 um, dimensional output. What they do is, is train one GP per output. So for the 180 outputs here, they will just like to train one GP for each one of them independently. So uh, one of the reasons is, as I told you in the beginning, is that GPs are not very, very good with high dimensions. And this is still uh, still uh, a question, an open question. There are some uh, some works that say it's not really the reason, but maybe the covariance matrix is the reason. So I'm not getting into these details. So this is one one remark that in general in the literature they do this. They train one GP per output. And what I did here also is that instead of doing a GP on all the uh, to model all the uh, the uh, mapping function. What I will do is that use some sort of a mean, which is um, a projection into a basis of functions. For example, you can use a polynomial transform uh, to your uh, inputs. Instead of just having f, h, c, and b, you can have f squared, h squared, c squared, b squared, and also have the interaction terms. So this can construct a basis. So this is your g 
g uh, g of x and you can like run uh, do a linear regression to just capture the mean capture the mean of your uh, mapping function and then for the epsilon you can use a gp here you can use a gp with a zero mean and the covariance which can be uh, and in, in this case that's what i did just the exponential classic uh, covariance covariance so you train your emulators. You have here 180 emulators, and then you calculate your implausibility. So uh, here I'm coming to the to the end of uh, of the presentation. This is uh, this is actually what you um, what you show in the end. These are called the Enroy plots. So I'll try to um, to explain them to you uh, very quickly, and maybe I'll take some time to to do that because they are a little bit uh, hard to um, to read. So remember, we have a four-dimensional four space, okay? So we want to, uh, to show a 40-dimensional space with 2D plots. For that, we will need four multiplied uh, three times, uh, 12 2D plots. But there are uh, similar, I mean, if you have A and B and B and A, you don't want to show both. So that's why you have six, six 2D plots, okay? So you have uh, six 2D plots in the triangular lower part, which are the minimum implausibility, and six other 2D plots in the uh, higher triangular part, which what we call the optical depth. As said with the optical depth, it's easier. The idea in the optical depth is that for each point in the grid, so uh, between F and H, uh, for example, you can check the uh, plot F and H, each point in the grid, you fix F and H, but you have C and B, which are uh, actually um, free. So you have a lot of values for C and B. So for that point in, gen in, uh, in particular, you will calculate the implausibility for all the other points in uh, C and B and do just a ratio of, uh, impl of plausible points uh, divided by the total, by the total. And that's uh, just a ratio to say that, yeah, in this region, there are more plausible, uh, plausible um, I mean, uh, sets of parameters than non-implausible ones, okay? And for the minimum implausibility, uh, the idea is that for each point again, you have another two di dimensions which are free, and you calculate the maximum implausibility for all those points, and then you take the minimum implausibility. Uh, no, you calculate the maximum implausibility for all the outputs, the 180 outputs, and then you take the minimum implausibility. So the lower, the better. So uh, actually in this NROI uh, plot, you can see that, for example, the, the star, the star is actually the true values. You will see that the stars are really close to the parts where you have minimum implausibility, which is a good indication. So you can get a lot of information from this minimum implausibility plots. Maybe in this case, there aren't a lot of information from the optical depth one. So if you can maybe just see the, the 2D FH plot, you will see that there are, the ratio is higher near near the, uh, the star. But for minimum implausibility, you have more information. Uh, concretely, concretely, you can see that, for example, for F, you don't need to, uh, to explore all the interval minus 2020, but just concentrate on the interval uh, 0, 20. And you can also uh, check for H. Uh, if H is negative, it's always actually uh, discarded. It's always the ruled out. So you know, for example, from this plot that H should be positive. So you can have and extract some information uh, like this to reduce your, uh, your input parameter search space. So yeah, as I said, this is an ongoing work and I'm, I'm actually in the end of my presentation, I just prepared a very quick uh, slide to let you know how can you contribute as a statistician or signal process um, researcher. For example, there is a, a question on how to sample the error region. I mean, this reduced part, that's a reduced part actually should be uh, sampled again if you want to do uh, more waves. If you want to do another wave, you should sample from it. And this time you cannot uh, just use latent hypercube sampling. You need to use more advanced space filling design. So we can uh, discuss about it later if you want. Maybe it's more interested to choose next point uh, instead of just sampling again to use them using some sort of metrics like what's done in Bayesian optimization when you want to, um, to uh, tune neural nets. Uh, there are maybe some relationships with MCMC -MC methods. I still didn't, uh, didn't really um, 
took a lot of time to, to explore that part. And for the first wave, you can maybe use techniques like ensemble Kalman uh, sampling, which will give you like uh, first points that are already close to the, your observation. So you don't need to do a light and hypercube sampling. So there are a lot of ideas like this, efficient techniques to find good kernel functions and mean functions to Gaussian process. And also data visualization is really important here. Uh, the annual uh, plots I, I showed you is one way to do data visualization, but maybe there are other ways which are more easier to understand. So yeah, maybe I'll just skip this and thanks a lot. Let's uh, leave some time to questions. Okay, thanks Redan, for, for this talk. Uh, there have been a few questions in the chat, especially, especially Dion. Dion, if you'd like to start? Yes, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Radon. And nice to see you again. <laughs> Thanks, likewise. Yes, uh, I had just a few uh, maybe stupid questions. So in a slide, you say that um, we can um, optimize, we can use some optimization methods to estimate the parameters of a climate model. But in order to use um, um, some specific um, optimization method, for example, gradient descent methods, mm -hmm. the log function must be differentiable. Uh, in my humble knowledge, uh, most of climate model yeah. is not differentiable. That's why we need yeah. a machine learning simulator. And how, how, how do we yeah. apply this idea? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see, I see your point. Uh, yeah, as I said, actually, uh, most of climate, yeah, and you said it also, most of climate models are not differentiable. So that's what you can, you can, uh, you can use non-gradient, I mean, non-gradient based techniques. Uh, it's not impossible to do uh, optimization, but it's not really the idea here, because if you do that, you are already um, having an assumption about the existence of a solution. So the very big difference between history matching and this uh, classic optimization uh, strategy is that in history matching, you are not doing this assumption. You are doing your history matching. And in the end, if you get, got some Enroy space, you are sure that some solutions exist already. But if you do just optimization directly uh, from the beginning, you are already doing this assumption as, and maybe this assumption is false. Maybe you will find the point, but it's not physically good or it's uh, just not a good solution. 